Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, ACC. You guys ready to dive into God's Word today? You guys want to be a church of wisdom, right? We're going to go into the book of Proverbs today, and we're going to spend some time in here gleaning some really important things. Uh, we're in week two of a, of a series called A Little Bit of Wisdom Goes a Long Way. But before we dive into this, I want to pause for a moment, and I want to uh, uh, use my, my, my pastoral privilege to just have a quick moment of conversation with everyone here. Uh, so we have... Uh, this thing, right? September 9th is our launch of our brand new life group season. And those of you who are specifically in this room, if you are not in a life group at the moment, if you're thinking, you know what, I haven't, I haven't joined one yet, I haven't found one yet, uh, stop whatever you're doing and pay attention to me for just a moment. We established at the beginning of this year a thing we're calling our 2020 vision. It's the church we want to be in, in 2020, the church that we believe God is calling us to be. And ultimately that goal, the way it works, is that we, we understand that God is now asking us not to be a church that has life groups, but to be a church of life groups. In other words, the goal is to, to be working heavily every year on building our life group ministry and making sure that everyone in this building who, pa who calls ACC home knows the importance of being in a life group. Uh, my life group I'll tell you what, my life group is so meaningful in my life. My wife and I, we don't lead the life group. We found a lot of value in going to a life group and just not being Pastor Matt, not being, you know, the pastor's wife, but just going and being a part of community. And we love our life group so much. We meet all summer long. We met this past week. Uh, if my kids really have a choice of like going to a friend's sleepover party or going to life group, they choose life group. That's how important life group is in our family. Uh, if you aren't in a life group, here's my ask. Here's, here's my, what I'm asking you to do as, as a lead pastor of this church. If you consider me your pastor, I'm asking you to join a life group. Uh, we've worked really hard to, to go from about 10 functioning life groups last year to 25 life groups that are ready for you to be in uh, September 9th. And there are so many different ways for you to find a life group. So many ways for you to get plugged in. You can go to our life group hub. It's a touch screen. You tell it what you're looking for, and we will find the life group that matches your needs. If you uh, want to go online to arundelcc.org slash life group, you can find the life group there. They are all over the place. We have life groups up in Baltimore. We have life groups down below Annapolis. We have life group wherever you are. We're going to find a life group. And if there's not one near you, guess what? We just found a new life group leader. <coughs> uh, we'll, we'll see how that works. It took you. Yeah, anyway, uh, we want you to be in a life group. Life groups will change your, your life. In fact, I'm willing to say this right now. I think being in a life group will have more impact in your faith and in the faith of your family than attending a corporate worship service here on a Sunday morning. So what we do here is important, but what happens in life group is where things get really deep and meaningful. So I want to encourage you today, uh, before September 9th, Join a life group. All of our life group leaders will be reaching out to families this week or next week to invite you and introduce you and give you directions to their home and, and all that good stuff. Um, so let's, let's move back in. Week two of a little bit of wisdom. We want to be a church that's known for wisdom. We want to be a church of people that are wise. We talked last week that the, the book of Proverbs shows us some different characters, right? We saw that there's the simple, there's the fool, 
uh, there's the mocker, uh, and then there's the wise. And we want to be known as people of wisdom. In fact, the Bible tells us, right in Proverbs 4-7, our theme verse for this series, is that getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. So if you want to know what is the wisest thing you can do, what, how do I, if you want to be the wisest person you can be, then you should do the wisest thing you should do, and the wisest thing you can do is to gain more wisdom, all right? So that's what we're going to spend some time doing over this, uh, this series, and uh, today we're going to dig a little bit more in. If you remember last week, we talked about the beginning of wisdom. How do you start? If you want to gain wisdom, you have to have a starting line. You've got to get up you know, behind the tape and, and kneel down and get ready to go. And that starting point right, was this thing called the fear of the Lord. The Bible tells us that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And that meant three different things. It's understanding that God is awesome, God is holy, and God is right. So we're going to say that together. Because if we want to go into this, this series and ge- glean anything out of it from God's word, we have to first understand that God is awesome, that God is holy, and God is right. I'm going to say it one more time, and then you're going to say it with me. So God is awesome, God is holy, and God is right. Are you ready? Here we go. God is awesome, God is holy, and God is right. Now, if we understand that, now we can build on top of that foundation. Because if we don't understand that God is who God says he is, if we don't understand that God is awesome and that we are not, then everything else we try to do is going to be kind of on us. And yet, we're, we're, that's, not the, that's, that's not the truth. So your little bit of wisdom from last week, as, as a recap, little bit of wisdom number one, was all wisdom flows from an understanding of who God is. That's where all wisdom is going to start. All wisdom understands begins from uh, the spot of understanding who God is. So now, as we transition into, if we have that foundation, if we understand that God is awesome, God is holy, and God is right, what can we build on top of that? And in Proverbs 19, uh, we're going we're gonna to add to this uh, puzzle today. So if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to grab it, uh, turn to the book of Proverbs. We're going to spend most of our time in Proverbs today. If you don't own a Bible, you can grab a Bible from the, the seat back in front of you and write your name on it, and then take it home with you so that you own a Bible. So everyone in this building, as of this moment, owns a Bible. Did you know that? Everyone owns a Bible here because I just gave you one if you don't have one. Uh, So Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23, starts like this. It says, the fear of the Lord leads to life. Remember, we, we know last week what the fear of the Lord is. God, being able to understand that God is awesome that God is holy and God is right. If you understand that, the Bible says here in Proverbs that that leads to what? Life. Say it with me. It leads to what? Life. Leads to life. And, that, and we have to be really clear here because there's a lot of definitions for what life means. If I get out the game of life, the, the board game, and I set it up, uh, the, the, the definition for that game of life, right, is to get as many kids as possible, as many houses as possible, get the best job, and I go through, and eventually finish with a big mansion and more money than everyone else. Like, that's the way the world tells us uh, that life is meant to be played. Like, try to finish with more stuff than anyone else, you win, right? But that's not the kind of life that this is talking about. The Bible explains that this, this thing called an abundant life, it's an understanding that when we know that God is awesome and that God is holy and that God is right, that understanding is going to lead to this abundant joy, to a satisfaction of who God is and who he's called us to be. And whatever it is that we have, whether it be a lot or a little, is going to be a, 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 a source of life for us. So now when we add to that verse, the second part of Proverbs nineteen twenty three, it says, the fear of the Lord leads to life, then one rests content. I love the word then in that verse. Once you understand the fear of the Lord and it leads to life, then... Once you figure this out, then the next thing, right, is that it, it, it leads to you being able to rest. Isn't that an amazing word? When we figure out how to do that, how many of you love naps? Man, I used to hate naps, but now, man, I crave a good nap. You know when my favorite time to nap is? Sunday afternoons. I was really looking forward to a nap today. My wife just told me my in-laws are coming into town. Um, <laughs> I love my in-laws, too, so it's kind of like, uh, all right. Well, anyway, a, a Sunday afternoon nap is like one of the best things ever. And he, here's one, one thing I've learned. In order to rest well, two things in my life kind of need to be in place. One, 
there's a thing called peace, just the peace of mind. Have you ever noticed that if your mind is moving like however many miles an hour and you just got this, that, and the other, and you got a to-do list a mile long, and you're worried about forgetting something, and, all the, and your mind is just running, that it's really hard to fall asleep? Have you ever uh, been so unable to fall asleep, you got to just like figure out how to close some windows and write some things down so you can finally have some peace of mind and go to sleep? Well, you know, on Sunday mornings, man, all the stuff that goes into Sunday services here and all the things I got to remember and I'm trying to remember, you know, what's my outline? How do I do this? And, and uh, you know, every morning it's just, man, my, my mind's moving however many miles per hour. And when I get home and all that is, whew, there's like a peace, right? And then there's another peace that's, uh, that's really helpful in, in rest, and that's this idea of comfort. When I rest at home, my nap times aren't maybe like yours. I don't just get up in the recliner and kick my feet up. Like, I, I go all in. I go up to the bed. <laughs> I take my shoes and my pants off, and I get under the covers. I mean, I'm like, this is, this is how you nap, okay? Because comfort... And, and this idea of a peace of mind, these are two really important elements to be able to rest, to have like a contented rest, to not have your mind and your body, I mean, doing this, this is my second time, the second service today, right? So I still got to preach another time and have been, you know, so, I mean, when I get in bed at the end of the day on a Sunday and I get to take a nap, man, I am comfortable and my mind is shut down and I rest content. And this idea of, Fear of the Lord, God is awesome, God is holy, God is right, leading to an abundant life, and that when you have this abundant life, that leads, then you can understand what it means to have this this peace of mind and this comfort in being able to just rest and understanding that everything you have in this very moment, everything you don't have in this very moment, God knows what he's doing. This, This concept of contentment is, is a really big deal. And we're going to spend some time today talking about this concept, the secret of contentment. Um, you know, this, this idea of, of contentment, what does it mean to understand that what you have is, is good and, and right, it's what God wants you to have, and, and all the other stuff? Uh, really, one way I can explain the process of comparison and contentment and how we struggle with this is, is in our understanding of, of technology. A technology, if you think about it, has, has never been more amazing. Do you know that? They say that a smartphone in your pocket replaces 50 things that you used to need. I mean, you have a smartphone, right? It, 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 it does all sorts of things. It's now like your entertainment device. You can listen to music through it, and you can, uh, you can you know, take pictures with it. And you can take video. You don't need a video camera anymore. You now have your phone. It, it's a calculator. You can even do this one thing on there. You can make phone calls on it. Like it, there's, it does all sorts of things. It replaces 50 different things that we used to need other devices for. There's a level on my iPhone. I can go up and level a photo in my, you know, it's just amazing. Technology is doing more than it's ever done before. And yet we tend to never be satisfied. Have you noticed that? You know, one of the coolest bits of technology is this thing called Netflix, right? You can go and watch, like, a, a, you know, a movie or whatever it is right there on demand. Yep. And then when you're watching a movie on Netflix, and there's that moment sometimes, if you're in my house maybe, uh, that it just stops, and you see that little wheel, that little spinny wheel. Yep. And we look at that, and we think, what is going on? Yeah, come on, I was in the middle of a movie, and now this i got to pause for 10 seconds for this little thing, and we get frustrated, right? Do you remember 20 years ago what you had to do to watch a movie? You had to get in your car, and you had to drive to this place called Blockbuster. Do you remember Blockbuster? And some, you know, punk high school kid were like, hey, do you know where a movie is? And he would just point, and you're like, okay. So you're like walking around trying to find a movie, and you don't know, and then maybe it's there, and if it's not there, you've got to drive to another blockbuster to find it. And when you finally do find it, it's a little cassette, right? You've got to get back in your car, drive home, put that little VHS thing in your VCR player, let the tracking thing work itself out, fast forward past the previews, and then when you're all done finally watching the movie, you're not done yet. What do you have to do then? Rewind, right? You've got to rewind it. Put it back in its case, get back in your car, and drive it back to Blockbuster, or you pay a fine, 
right? This is what we used to have to do to watch a movie. And now, 10 seconds of spinning wheel makes me upset. <laughs> like, we are never satisfied, huh? Like, this, this, this problem with a lack of contentment is a pretty big deal. So if we can figure out the secret of contentment, if we can learn what it means to be able to rest content, that would be a really, really cool thing. And I want to help us do that. I want to remind you that the wise master contentment. The simple, the fool, and the mocker live in comparison. See, these are two different things. Contentment and comparison don't go together. If you want to be a wise person, what you're going to do is you're going to listen today. You're going to hear some truth from God's word because you're going to desire uh, to master. I want to learn more about what does it mean to be content? How can I be a content person? I want to master that instead of continually living in comparison with other people and all their stuff. So let's take a moment and learn this secret of contentment. God, I ask that you would, you would speak through me here in this moment, that you would help me to, to clearly communicate what it means to be a person of contentment, what this secret looks like, and why comparison is so dangerous. God, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me share with you... Um, a verse out of Proverbs 14, 30. It says, a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. And jealousy is like cancer to the bones. This, this idea of contentment and comparison, these two kind of things that are at odds with each other, I want to share with you first why we want to avoid this thing of comparison. So three things I want to share with you. Three, I'm going to call them the problems with comparison. And the first problem with comparison is that it assumes incorrectly. Uh, comparison assumes incorrectly. And here's what I mean by that. If you take the sentence, if only I had blank, then I would be happy. That's the assumption of comparison. When you look over the fence and you see what your neighbors have, you think, if only I had that, if only I had that job, if only I was married to so-and-so, if only I could, whatever, if only my, this car was in my garage, if only, and you put a blank there, and you tell yourself, if only I had this, then I would be happy. That's the problem. One of the problems with comparison is that it assumes this, this, this concept of, if only I had this, then I would be happy. The problem is, is that comparison is a moving target, isn't it? What do we learn as soon as we fill in the blank and we get that thing? You notice we rewrite the sentence. Oh, just kidding. If only I had, and we add to it, right? Oh, man, that wasn't it, I guess. If only I had, in this comparison thing, do you guys know the comedian Jim Carrey? Yep. Jim Carrey once said in an interview, he said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they dreamed of so that they could see that it's not the answer. He had learned later on in his life that having all the rich and uh, richness and all the fame and all the things, that that wasn't a, a key to making anyone happy. It was a poor assumption right off the get-go. There was a study of people who make over $25 million a year. I don't think, I don't, as far as I know, there's no one in the room right now that's in this uh, bracket. <laughs> if you are, really glad you're here at ACC. <laughs> Um, so a study of people who make over $25 million a year trying to understand whether or not through their wealth they had attained happiness. And on average, more than not, people in that bracket answered this question that if, if they thought they could be happy if they made just 25% more than they do now. You see, comparison is a moving target. There's always going to be something to fill in the blank with. It's not going to satisfy you. It doesn't matter what you've, you put in there. If it's, if, it's on, if it's a person or a thing that's on this, like, it's not going to work. There's only one thing that fills in that blank, and we'll get to that. Here's another problem with comparison is that it sees things incorrectly. You know, one of the biggest problems with uh, social media, and I'm not, I'm not knocking social media, I, you know, used well, it can be a good thing, but one of the problems with social media, if you think about it, is that it's, it's a, like a breeding ground for comparison. 
people, I, I think I've learned a rule that if you're going to put something really, really nice up, a picture of something new, but you don't want to come across as braggy, all you have to do is hashtag blessed after it. Did you know that? <laughs> hashtag blessed, and you can get away with whatever you want. You can, I'm the coolest person ever, hashtag blessed. And I'm like, oh, he's just, he's humble. No, <laughs> yeah, that's not how it works, right? So people will put stuff on social media. It'll be, you know, and that's not bad. You know, it's good to be thankful for things that God's doing in your life. Uh, you get it, you know, but that's when nobody goes on social media and says, look at this piece of junk I just bought, right? They, they show off their best stuff. Look at this new car. Look at how I met my fitness goal. Look at my new promotion. Look how smart my kids are. Look how pretty my baby is, right? Social media is kind of a place for if you are a person who struggles with comparison, you're going to go into social media and you're going to see things incorrectly. You're only seeing what people want you to see. You're not seeing the truth of everything that's going on in their lives. You're missing out now on all the blessings that you have because you're seeing everyone else's stuff. See, in Proverbs 14, verse 11, it says, The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the godly will flourish. Do you ever look across the street and what you see makes your house look like a tent? <laughs> Have you ever been driving and you're like, oh man, look at that house. Mine's nothing. compared. Man, I, I live in a little shack compared to that thing. The Bible says, listen, when you see things incorrectly, when you're using earthly eyes, you're going to look and everything you see is going to be seen incorrectly. You're going to be comparing and you're going to see the house of the wicked. And in comparison, you're, gonna, to, to, you're not going to realize that what you really have, uh, maybe that's exactly what God called you to. My wife and I and our kids, we, we live in a, a townhouse. We're, we're blessed. We love it. It's our little tent. It's exactly what God's called us to. And I'm not saying that if you have a house, that's bad. God's called you to that. But listen, I'm not going to compare what I have to what you have if I'm doing things the wise way. Because I trust that God's blessed me and my family with what he wants us to have. There's another study that shows that if you spend 10 minutes or more on social media a day, on average, you're less happy, less satisfied, more stressed, and more anxious. Do you know that? So make sure that you don't see things incorrectly, and that's going to happen when you compare what you have to what other people have. Here's another problem with comparison is that it motivates incorrectly. Comparison motivates us uh, not by what God wants us to be motivated by, but it motivates us by what other people do and have. Instead of being motivated, uh, hey, I want to pursue this because this is what God is calling me to. Instead, we pursue that because so-and-so has that and I want that too. You see, it motivates incorrectly. Have you heard of this thing called FOMO? Anyone? Raise your hand. Uh, FOMO, if that's... It's a, I see a few hands. It stands for the fear of missing out. It's a real thing. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's this understanding that if, if I, let's, the best way to explain it is if I'm having a party and I go up to my friends and say, are you coming to my party? If I tell them, yeah, everyone's coming to my party, you're going to be the one who's not there. Guess what's going to make them come to my party? FOMO. The fear of missing out. They don't want to be the one person that doesn't miss out on this party. Right, But if they know that nobody's coming, they're not worried about coming to the party. Why? Because they're making a decision not based on whether or not they want to or whether or not maybe God's calling them to be at my party, but whether or not other people are going to the party. This fear of missing out. And we make decisions all the time. And when we live in comparison, we're, we're motivated by what other people are doing and by what other choices other people are making instead of what God is calling us to. What everyone else is doing shouldn't really motivate us. Proverbs 23, 17 says, Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. Always be yearning for more understanding of God's awesomeness and God's holiness and God's rightness. And when you are zealous for that, when you pursue that, you're not going to care about being motivated by what other people have. You see, the problem with comparison is it assumes incorrectly, it sees things incorrectly, and it motivates incorrectly. The, the key word there I want you to walk away with, incorrectly. Comparison is not the right way to do things. 
Proverbs 23, 17 says, do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous. So we got to remember that we want to, to be motivated by the right things and not by the wrong things. All right. So Paul tells us how to pull that off. I love this. We're going to switch over to the New Testament for a minute. Uh, and Paul, he, he talks about in Philippians this, this concept uh, called the secret of contentment. I love this word, this secret. How many of you uh, hate being on the outside of a secret you know about, right? You know there's a secret and you want in. You want, right? We want on the inside of the secret. Well, Paul's telling us right now there's this thing that's so hard for us to figure out, this thing called contentment. And none of us are any good at it. In fact, to really understand how to do contentment well, there's a secret to it. There's like a little hidden recipe. There's some things we got to put in the mix and stir in in order to understand what contentment is. And so I want to explore this secret because I want us to be people who can rest content, who understand how to be content. So Philippians 4 is where Paul tells us about this secret and where he unveils the secret to us. Proverbs, or sorry, Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13, it says, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be, what's that word? Content with whatever I have. So he's about to tell us that he's learned the secret to being content no matter what. And by no matter what, he goes into greater detail. I know how to live on almost nothing. How many of you have been there? Or with everything, how many of you have had abundance in your life and seasons? Paul's figured out how to live content in either circumstance. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach. How many of you have been there? Yesterday, it was my birthday. That was, man, ooh, a full stomach. Uh, uh, Or with plenty or with little. How many of you have had empty stomachs in seasons of your life? See, Paul's saying, I have learned that I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So we have this this word in here that's mentioned, I have learned the secret. That's a, I want in. I want in on this. I want to know what is the secret to being a person who is content. And the first thing that Paul points out in his revelation is this, realize what you have. Do you know that the things you have right now in your life they are a gift from God that you are hashtag blessed, regardless of whether or not you got a new car to show for it. Do you know that every day that you wake up, you are hashtag blessed? Do you know that you can look at the things that you have, the, the blessings around you, and see that if you take the time and you count your blessings, you have so much to be thankful for. You have no reason to focus on what other people have because God has given you uh, an abundance Even if you are in a season where you're like, Matt, you don't know right now. I just lost my job and I lost my house and I lost. Listen, count what you do have. If you tell me, Matt, you don't understand, you have that and I don't, you're comparing right now in that statement. You see, don't don't compare in in this understanding of what you have to what I have and my ability to say we all need to be content. All of us need to learn to count what we have, to be thankful and realize what we have. It's a, it's a really important step in this. I remember my wife and I, at one point, before we had any kids, I lost my job. And our house was a, a, attached to the job, and our income clearly was attached to the job, and our health insurance was attached to the job. My dignity uh, seemed to have been attached to this job. And when I lost that job, within a week, we were now jobless, homeless, incomeless, insuranceless, you name it. I remember the pity party we threw for ourselves. And not realizing in that moment, man, God's blessed us with in-laws that, that welcome us. And uh, we, I, I don't, we didn't go hungry, did we? We still found, uh, we found jobs quickly and uh, found out we were pregnant two weeks later with our first daughter. And, and you just pause for a moment and think of what you have. Realize what you have. Because the truth is this, and I, I don't want anyone to miss this. When I think of the blessings I have in my life, and I'm being really honest with you, I have way more than I deserve. Anyone else understand that? Uh, the best verse I can see that really explains this concept is in 1 Timothy. It says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, 
And then Paul says, and I am the worst of them all. Anybody ever here feel like, oh, well, Paul probably meant that when he said it, but he, I hadn't been born yet? You know, the worst of sinners idea. I'm like, man, yeah, that's only because I wasn't alive yet. So Paul's saying, I'm the worst of the sinners. He says, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Listen, realize, Christian, what you have. It's way more than you deserve. So if you want, a, uh, you want a homework assignment for step number one, it's this. Make a list. I encourage you to buy a thankful journal. Buy a, a book. Uh, grab something that you can write down every day, things that God has blessed you with, things that bless things in your life. Make a list. There's a, there's a book out by a woman named Ann Voskamp, 1,000 Gifts. And as her explaining a journey in her own life of overcoming anxiety through listing out all the blessings that God has given her. Here's another secret to contentment, is make God your source. Remember the end of that verse says, I can do all things through who? Christ. Through Christ, right? I can do all things through God. Every, everything I have, the power I have is from Him and through Him. Through Him, I have everything I need. Everything that God wants me to do, I have the power to do it through the source, which is God. This is a really important understanding. And I, sometimes I say things like this, and maybe you're in this room right now, and you think I'm being really narrow-minded. Like, is Matt really saying that Jesus, that God is the only source, that he is the only way back to a restored relationship with God? That's just rude. Maybe you think right now I'm being rude. I want you to know, and I, I say this with as much love as I can muster up. I think it would be rude of me to say anything other than that. Amen. Because it's true. Jesus is the only way back to a restored relationship with God. And God is the source, and when you give your life to Him, you're, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us that the Spirit that lives within us is the same Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. You have and I have within me. We have that kind of a power within us. And then Philippians 2 tells us to work hard to show the results of our salvation. If I just right there, that this concept of working hard, what it really means is imagine like you're digging for gold, okay? You go into this dirt, and as you dig, you're going to encounter more and more goodness. You're going to encounter gold, and if you want to find more gold, you got to keep digging this concept of working out your faith with fear and trembling. That's ultimately this verse in the NIV. That's how I remembered it. Uh, the concept is simple. This is my to-do for you. This is what I want you to do. I want you to dig deep. I want you to spend time with the source. I want you to spend time with God. Dig deep and spend time with Him. I'm going to invite the band uh, back onto stage, and I want to give you the last secret to contentment. And this one is my favorite one. So if you haven't been taking notes yet. <laughs> this is the one to write down, all right? If you have taken notes, this is the one to circle, all right? The last secret to contentment is to live life on mission. Let me do my best to explain what this means. What does it mean, what does it look like to live life on mission and the best way to explain it is go back to Paul in, in Philippians chapter 3. And this is, what, this is what Paul says. He says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I, what's this next word? But I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let me do my best to understand how when you live life on mission, it's a really key ingredient to this secret of contentment. 
Because get this. When you have your eyes fixed on your purpose, when you understand that God put you on this planet for a reason, and you understand what that is, and you have your eyes fixed on that, you have your eyes focused on what God is calling you to, the mission and the purpose you've been put on this earth to accomplish. When you have your eyes fixed on mission, when you have your eyes fixed on Christ, guess what you don't see? You don't see the grass on the other side of the fence, do you? You don't see the the house compared to your tent. Everything else, when your eyes are focused, becomes blurry. You don't notice all the, the, the good things that are supposedly happening in other people's lives. At least you, you don't care to compare what you have to that because your eyes are fixed on what God is calling you to. And guess what? God might not be calling you to have a brand new car in your garage. He might not be calling you to have, uh, you know, uh, my, my middle daughter, Madeline, she, she's already told me with excitement what she wants to do with her life when she grows up. She says, Dad, I want to, I want to learn Spanish right now, and I want to go to the Dominican Republic as a missionary. I want to teach people how to dance, and I want to teach them about Jesus. And I tell her, listen, what a great goal, but listen, if her goal is to have just a bunch of stuff and to constantly compare what she has with what you have her goal is going to get tripped up on every turn. But when she fixes her eyes on mission, and when, she, when you and I fix our eyes on our purpose, we're not going to be paying attention to what anyone else has. It's the secret to contentment right there. This church is full of people who figured out how to live their life on purpose. And I think of our servant leaders in this church, people who who serve without pay because they love the purpose and mission and vision of this church. It's a no-brainer. I think of people in my life group. I think of uh, two people that, man, just, you just see their attitude and joy even when bad things and hard things are happening in their life. I think of the Berger family. I don't know if you guys know James and Kim Berger. Man, I, I talk about a family who has embraced what it means to live life on purpose so that what's happening in other people's lives doesn't really matter. I want that. For me, I want that for you. So here's what I want to do. Our, our do this is to embrace your purpose. This is a, the last homework for you, is to figure out what God's calling you to. Embrace your purpose. Our little bit of wisdom today is this. Contentment fills me with life and fortifies me from circumstance. You all do me a favor and stand up for a second here. I want to invite everyone to do this. I'm, um, I want to lead us. I want to do something a little odd. We don't normally do this at ACC, but I'm going to lead us in a corporate prayer. And what I mean by that is I'm going to start, I'm going to pray out loud, and I'm going to just take a moment in my prayer to thank God for all the blessings that he's given to me. I'm going to pray a prayer of contentment, telling God I'm thankful for exactly the lot that he has chosen to give me and my family. And at some point in my prayer, I'm going to invite you, church, to pray out loud with me. We're all going to be praying. We're all going to do this together. If you prefer to pray quietly, you can do that. But I want to encourage you to pray out loud. And we're going to pray just a prayer of contentment in this place and ask God to make us a people who are content. If you want, I'm going to have just a posture of my hands open and just uh, realizing all the stuff that I have. I'm pretending that it's sitting here in my arms. I want to invite you to do the same. God, I'm so thankful for this, this life that you've given me. I'm so thankful for all the, the things and all the blessings I get every day, even if I don't understand them, even if things happen that, that I quite don't understand. God, I know that you have blessed me. God, I am so thankful for this church and the way you're working in this church. God, and you're, you're teaching us to be a church of people who, who want to be wise and who fear the Lord and have learned the art of being content with, with anything a God who is awesome, holy, and right sees fit to give us. God, we recognize that it's exactly what we need. So God, now I invite this church. We're going to pray a prayer of thankfulness and contentment over the blessings we have in our lives. 
And God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start us off. Pray with me, church. God, I'm so thankful for my, my family. God, I'm thankful for my, my beautiful wife, and I'm thankful for my kids. God, I'm thankful that you sent Jesus to this earth, not just to die on the cross in my place, but to, to die in the place of my wife and my girls so that together we can spend an eternity with you. God, I'm thankful for my job. God, I'm thankful for the home and, and the food that you allow us to, 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 to protect us and to, to nourish us. God, I'm thankful for my friends and, and my life group. I'm thankful for the people in this room right now that, that lift me up and, and pour into me and encourage me and, and spur me on. God, I'm thankful for opportunities to worship you. I'm thankful for the breath that you've given me this morning. God, I, I recognize that everything I have is, is a gift from you. That I don't need to worry about what other people have. I don't need to think about what my neighbors have in comparison to what I have. Because, God, you're doing your own work in their lives. God, you're doing a work in my life. And I want, I want to uh, know and be thankful and content of what you're doing in my life. So God, together as a church, I, I lead us right now and I pray, make us a church that is content because we love and worship a God who is awesome and who is holy and who is right. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, as you stay standing here for just a moment, I've... I want to introduce this next song. There's a lyric in this song that says, It was my tomb until I met you. Is there a better reason to be thankful and content this morning? Those of you, those of you who have given your life to Christ, listen, it was your tomb. It was your death. It was your price to pay. And God sent his son to take it and pay the price for you. And if there's ever a reason to be content, that's it. God, I ask again, make us a church that worships your greatness. God, help us to be a church that recognizes your, your awesomeness and your holiness and your righteousness. God, as we worship you right now, we, we worship you recognizing that you are a God who sent your son to this earth because you loved us and you rescued us from our own sin. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together, church. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, Please remember, you belong at ACC.